British people have given us the chance to serve you. You have put your trust in us, and we say to you, we shall repay that trust for you. We govern for you. It is six o'clock on Friday, May the 2nd. It is a landslide for Labour, a landslide of historic proportions that has left the Conservative Party in disarray. Tony Blair becomes the youngest Prime Minister this century. It is predicted that Labour could end up with a majority of over 180. Conservatives have been wiped out in Scotland and Wales. Six of the Cabinet have lost their seats. It's been a good night for the Liberal Democrats, who are likely to have the highest number of MPs for them since the war. And Martin Bell wins the battle for Tatton. For the next three hours, we will take you through the events of this extraordinary night. We'll be getting reaction and, of course, analysis from Robin Oakley and Tony King here in the studio. The political map of this country has been completely torn up. It has been ripped to shreds. Labour have won a victory that has stunned their opponents and amazed their supporters. It is Labour's best ever result and the Conservatives' worst this century. Of the 625 seats that have declared, let us look now at the state of the parties. Labour have 416, gain of 145. The Conservatives have 158, that is a loss of 174. The Liberal Democrats have 40, they've gained 25 seats. The Nationalists have 10, that's up three, and the other parties so far have one seat. Moving on from that to the share of the vote. 45% to Labour, 31% to the Conservatives, 17% to the Liberal Democrats, and 7% to the others. Moving on from that to big losers this evening, of whom there have been many. The Defence Secretary, Michael Portillo, and the Foreign Secretary, Malcolm Rifkin. Also losing this evening, the Trade Secretary, Ian Lang. William Waldgrave, the Treasury Chief Secretary, Tony Newton, the leader of the Commons. What then did the party leaders have to say of it all? John Major said this, we have been comprehensively defeated, we will listen to the voice of the electorate and we will reflect on it. Tony Blair, who will now become Prime Minister, said this, you have put your trust in me, I intend to repay that trust, I will not let you down. Now we can hear the story of the night from our uh, digital correspondent Jeremy Vine, who is, I think, at uh, Labour Party headquarters. Jeremy. Justin, thank you very much indeed. I'm at the Royal Festival Hall, actually, although it has been Labour Party headquarters uh, this morning because uh, party members are just filing out here, having had uh, a huge party, having seen Mr Blair come and go and make a huge speech to them. They are stunned by the size of this victory for them. They're amazed by it and they're overjoyed. This has been an incredible night for Mr. Blair and his party. Before the curtain went up on the night of his life, just a hint of nerves. Then his once more famous father-in-law, Tony Booth, led the family outing to the Sedgefield Count. There the children, Ewan, Nicholas, and Catherine, who's nine, stayed up past their bedtime to watch Mum acknowledge one result that was never in doubt and Dad offer words of consolation to one Tory who had no reason for disappointment. And if I can say this to um, Lizzie, who came second and who is the Conservative candidate, I once fought a very uh, hopeless Conservative seat in Beaconsfield in the south of England and look what happened to me. By the time he reached his local Labour club, safe Tory seats were tumbling everywhere, and the Prime Minister-in-waiting allowed himself a little cautious confidence. Well, you know me, I'm never complacent, but... <laughs> no, it's looking very good all around the country. 
however, the party faithful had already started called, celebrating live on air. They were called champagne socialists, but they're clearly very incompetent champagne socialists. Labour's most glamorous couple, the Follets, had a bit of court trouble at their do. Down in London, credit for this super soar away result for Labour was a little unreasonably being claimed by the paper which once derided all the party stood for. But nothing could dampen the enthusiasm of those who'd waited 18 years to finally end an election night as winners. For the new tenants of number 10, it was almost too good to be true. Mike Donkin, BBC News. Jeremy, you get the impression that they really did not believe, genuinely did not believe, that they would win by this kind of margin. Absolutely not, Justin. They have had, we've all had, I think, this culture since the 1992 election where we simply do not believe the polls. They were wrong then. This time, they've turned out to be pretty much right. These spectacular Labour leads have actually translated into seats in the House of Commons. So all the Peter Snow stuff on the, the swingometer and so on was actually all the forecasts were actually accurate. It's taken them all by surprise. They're seeing candidates come in for Wimbledon, for example, for other seats where they didn't think they had a prayer of winning, even though they knew in the final days, I think very strongly, that they were going to take power. So you have this interesting situation where people have won quite unexpectedly, and for them, a huge sense that the country has turned to them in a very definite way, has said yes to what new labor is about, and has said yes and given a huge personal vote, in a way, to Tony Blair. That's what they're talking about here, the fact that this is a massive personal victory for Mr Blair as well. All right, Jeremy, thank you. I think we can cross now to um, Conservative Central Office and to uh, John Sopel. John, I imagine the mood uh, is pretty different there. Well, for the Conservative Party, this is the worst result in modern political history. And the mood inside the place went from sadness to despair in a very short time when it became clear that the results that were coming in were absolutely catastrophic. People seemed absolutely shell-shocked, unable to believe the scale of the defeat that was being inflicted upon them. And even before the polls had closed, the recriminations had begun, even though Michael Heseltine had called for a period of calm reflection. They dominated government. They've been famous political faces for years, but their high profiles couldn't save them. Ian Lang in Galloway, and in Enfield, Michael Portillo, the Defence Secretary, and some said the Tories' heir apparent. In Harrogate, Norman Lamont, and William Waldegrave all lost their seats as the Conservatives felt the voters' wrath. Colleagues looked on in wondering dismay as the political toll mounted. It was even worse than the gloomiest could have imagined. It was early in the evening when David Meller, another famous loser, faced up to the scale of what was happening. A tidal wave has burst over the Conservative Party tonight, and uh, it wasn't a question of putting your hand in the dike, it was a question of the seawall collapsing all around you. Um, but uh, I bear no grudges about that. I think that uh, we're not a one-party state, and it is inevitable at some point that um, uh, the government will change. It was late in the evening when John Major appeared for the count at his Huntingdon seat. He won it at least, but inevitably now, the question of the party leadership is unavoidable. The now ex-Chancellor says the party wants cool heads, not hot argument. For us to fall to mutual recriminations at any time will be folly. For people within two hours of the polls closing to start going into mutual recriminations is extreme folly. And I do think the party needs to compose itself, lose with dignity. And at Tory central office, a party which had almost forgotten what defeat means, was learning that hard lesson again. Robin Aitken, BBC News. Hard lesson indeed, John Sopel. But actually, when John Major addressed his party faithful there, um, it was an extraordinary performance, wasn't it? A, 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 a performance that, that denied almost that a defeat on this scale had happened. Well, I just think that the Conservative Party can't believe it. Every day I've been travelling with the Prime Minister for the past four weeks, every day he's been telling us the polls are completely wrong, the response we're getting on the doorstep is utterly different, it's much better out there in the country, and I think the Prime Minister genuinely believed it. 
And I think that is why the scale of the defeat is yet to hit home. The Prime Minister has no doubt about it. The Conservatives were given a pasting uh, last night in the polls and there is going to be considerable regrouping. Of course, big questions still remain. What John Major didn't say either in Huntingdon or here at Conservative Central Office when he get back, get, came back is what he does next. What, is he going to carry on as leader in the long term, short term, medium term? The Conservative Party in the past has had a rather ruthless record with ex-leaders who've lost elections. John Sopel for the time being. Thank you very much. So what are the Liberal Democrats? The uh, Lib Dems are celebrating winning more seats than any third party has for 60 years. As well as holding on to traditional strongholds in the southwest, there were a clutch of unexpected gains. Paddy Ashdown said the party's success would help create a parliament of historic reform. Two o'clock in the morning and Liberal Democrats gathered at a London restaurant begin to celebrate a record-breaking performance. As returning officer for the Torbay constituency, I hereby give notice... In Torbay, the, the first of a flurry of gains took time candidate. coming. But after several recounts, the Lib Dems' Adrian Sanders defeated the Conservative candidate and spy writer Rupert Allison by just 12 votes. It is 73 years since we lent this seat to the Conservative Party. The breakthrough that Paddy Ashton had hoped for was sweeping the country. Victories in North Avon and Colshorton and Wallington were among the least predicted. But in Rochdale, Liz Lynn and her supporters couldn't hide their feelings as they realised they were about to lose a seat. Cyril Smith had first won in 1972. As the party looked forward to a House of Commons with the largest number of Liberal MPs since Lloyd George, some no doubt reflected that they'd done it without proportional representation. In previous parliaments, they could have expected to wield real power, but Labour's large majority suggests that Liberal Democrat influence may be limited. Charles Rhodes, BBC News. Let's go to Liberal Democrat headquarters and our correspondent Nicola Carslaw, who is uh, there. Nicola, you get the impression from what we've heard from the Lib Dems through the night is that they are not intending to go to this parliament as an opposition party. They're kind of hoping that in some way they are going to have a considerable influence over this government. That's right. They're absolutely delighted, as you can uh, imagine, by the, the gains and by what can clearly be seen as a breakthrough. They were only hoping, after all, to have 30 seats and to have what looks like at least, well, 45. Um, they're obviously absolutely thrilled, and so they believe that they can be a, a legitimate opposition. Um, but, of course, they've also talked about being cooperative and co constructive in opposition. All right, Nicola, thank you. We should go to uh, number 10 now, which, after all, is... Uh what it's all about and George Eakin is there. George, um, this is a brutal business now isn't it? What, what, what happened? What's the timetable of the day? Well it's all been put back a bit Justin because the idea was that the Prime Minister would have finished at uh, central office and be back here by now snatching a bit of sleep on uh, this what remains of the night uh, before leaving uh, later in the morning to uh, for his audience with the Queen. He isn't back yet so everything's put back it doesn't look like he'll get any sleep here at all uh, his private secretary will be, we know, seeking a meeting with the Queen on his behalf at about 11.30 this morning. What happens then is uh, he'll be driven out in the Prime Ministerial car and uh, for about 20 minutes or half an hour, Britain will technically have no Prime Minister in the interim before Tony Blair arrives at Buckingham Palace once uh, the Queen's private secretary, Sir Robert Fellows, has telephoned him to invite him for an audience. He will then uh, kiss the Queen's hands and assume the responsibility of Prime Minister and be driven here straight to number 10 uh, to take up office. All right, George, thank you very much. At number 10, doubtless we'll hear from you again during the course of the programme. It is time, though, to get a more thorough analysis of it, exactly what has happened. And the person to do that is Peter Snow. Peter. Well, Justin, here's how the electoral tidal wave by the opposition swept over the Britain we've been used to for the last five years. That's the old parliament of the last five years. Just look what happened this time. Now you see the red and gold, and there's my, Martin Bell in Tatton, the great wave of red and gold stretching across the country there, and the changes up on the top right there, Labour up 146 to a 419 that Labour have never scored before, anything like that, never before over 400 in the history of the Labour Party. The Tories down 177, the Liberal Democrats doubling their representation in the Commons, and the others up four. And there now you see the gains flashing away, and here are the... These are the 
seats that the Labour Party was targeting. This is the great mass of Conservative seats, only three of them there, Liberal Democrats, and one Plaid Cymru in Wales, that Mr Blair's sights were on. Let's see how effectively he did. The higher the block, the more difficult it was for Labour to hit. Now, as you watch the hits clocking up there in the little box on the bottom left-hand corner, we'll fly over these targets, starting with Falmouth and Camborne down to the toe of England there, and nearly all going to go down to the Labour Party attack. Seats in London, there only uh, Simon Hughes surviving in uh, Southwark and Bermondsey and lost in a great massive uh, series of tower blocks of new red majorities in London, up in the uh, northeast and the northwest, and now we're going up to Scotland, and there's uh, Michael Forsyth, Seal and Stirling. That's two, the Scottish Secretary seat, now a substantial Labour majority. So there is the effective fire uh, of the uh, Labour Party on its Conservative target seats. 98 hits, only two misses, including Kerry Diggian over there in Wales. It really has been an astonishing uh, success for Labour, very successful targeting by the opposition of the crucial seats. Look back at Labour's victories in the past. There goes Winston Churchill down to a landslide defeat in 1945, Labour majority of 147. Here goes Ted Heath defending himself against uh, Harold Wilson's attack in 1966. He was buried in a Labour majority of 97. And now here we have John Major in 1997, a Labour landslide victory, a majority of 179. It's the worst uh, landslide defeat for the Conservatives since way back in 1945. Into the House of Commons now to see the shape of the new House on the opposition benches. First, John Major's Conservative Party with now a tiny 166, the lowest since 1906. Now we have uh, Paddy Ashton, the Liberal Democrats, with twice the representation they had before, 45. The others, 29, including, of course, Martin Bell in Tatton and the Unionists, the Nationalists in Scotland and Wales and so on. There's the winning post that Tony Blair's Labour Party has to get through. If he's going to win this election, we know he's way through it. In fact, some of his MPs are going to have to sit on the other side of the House with so many of them. 419, subtract the opposition total from that 419, uh, and you get a Labour majority of 179, Justin. Peter, thank you. Now, of course, uh, results still coming in, and we can bring you some of the most recent ones uh, in the Forest of Dee. No Buckingham we're going to start with. Buckingham result there. It is a conservative hole with a pretty sizable majority. Let's look at the uh, Lemster result as well. Peter Temple Morris has held on, uh, again with a majority that won't cause him too many sleepless nights. And Forest of Dean, there is a Labour win. We might be able to look at the swing there in the Forest of Dean to Labour, which I think we can bring you just now. No, apparently we can't. Anyway, there has uh, been a win for Labour in the Forest of Dean. Let's talk now to um, Tony King and Robin Oakley. They've been kind enough to stay with us now uh, through the night. Um, let's talk about tactical voting, first of all, um, Robin Oakley, of which there has been a great deal. Indeed, uh, it is tactical voting which has turned a defeat for the Conservatives into an absolute rout. Both parties have been able effectively to target their key seats and Labour have found Liberal Democrats switching to them in seats where they were the best chance of getting the Conservatives out. It's worked the other way around in Liberal Democrat seats. Labour votes have tended to fall away a bit there, transferring to the Liberal Democrats uh, to help them get the Tories out where they had the best chance of doing so. It's a, now a clearly established phenomenon in British political life. We've seen it happening uh, through this last Parliament, lo local government elections, European elections, parliamentary by-elections. Well, we're just seeing the scene at uh, Conservative Party Central Office where there is something that looks uh, remarkably like a removal van there. Of course, isn't it? It's actually a sort of porter cabin, isn't it? It's being moved up next to the door. I think we're expecting to see at some stage now Mr. Major leaving, but we can't see anything at the moment. There's nothing much happening. Let's, let's, let's carry on talking while these scenes come up and go away, and if anything happens, we'll uh, interrupt ourselves and mm. go back to them. Um, there we are, looking at Conservative Party Central Office. So, Tony King, what happens now? What happens to the party? What do they do about the leadership? Well, I think they've got two terrible problems. Uh, the easier one is, in fact, the leadership. I imagine that John Major will want to stay on to ensure an orderly su succession. I imagine that he will want to stay on till, say, about July, which is what people are talking about. And then there will be the fight. But, of course, not all the pugilists will be there. Uh, Michael Portillo is amongst the people who lost his seat. There's been, a, incidentally, a tremendous call of cabinet ministers, the largest since the war. 
their more difficult problem is not the leadership, but it's the direction of the party, because the Tories are deeply divided, not merely over Europe, but about the, the inheritance of Mrs. Thatcher. Do they continue to be basically a Thatcherite party, or do they revert to being a more traditional one-nation party? In, and they're going to have an awful time sorting that out. In your view, are we looking realistically at the prospect of a split, of a formal split? I think not. The Conservative Party has been united for a very long time, uh, certainly since the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it's not in the interest of any individual Conservative MP to split the party. I find it very hard to imagine they're doing that. The split in the Labour Party that took place in the early 1980s, after all, didn't do much good to the people who split off. Robin Oakley, put your money on someone. I mean, uh, as, uh, there are so many, as, as, as Tony was saying, several of the contenders are actually not going to be there to be contenders anymore. There are some obvious ones, some obvious folk who are going to be there. No one has, uh, in any sense, run with it so far. Everyone's been very cautious, haven't they, overnight? Um, put, put your money on a candidate. Well, there are strengths and weaknesses of the different candidates. Uh, Michael Heseltine had a good election for the Tories. He is a highly experienced figure, a charismatic figure. But many people will look at that Labour majority and say, look, it, Tony Blair is surely in for two terms. Michael Heseltine is probably too old. Michael Portillo is now out of the running because he hasn't got a seat. Uh, William Hague very much comes into the running, the Welsh Secretary, only 36, uh, a man of the right, but not one of those on the right who upsets the left. So he has got quite strong credentials in terms of being a reasonable party unity candidate. Stephen Dorrell, perhaps too many gaffes uh, in recent months, uh, seen as a man of the left, although he's tacked across to the right. Uh, John Redwood, obviously a very strong candidate for the right. He would want the contest to be as soon as possible. He's had effectively two years in opposition already, freed from the collective responsibility of the cabinet to make his mark, to have an established pitch as a right-wing Eurosceptic. Uh, Kenneth Clark, the former chancellor, met to many people the most effective uh, combative politician in the Tory party, but almost disqualified from any chance because he is so keen on Europe. OK, Robin, those are the runners and riders. We'll come back to you both later on. Um, of course, people joining us all the time. It's important that we update things. It's 22 minutes past six now. Let's hear the story of the night from our political correspondent, Lance Price. It was the kind of victory party that in 18 years of opposition, Labour feared they might never see again. A scale of victory that nobody from Tony Blair down believed would be theirs. But theirs it was. As the new Prime Minister-to-be acknowledged the cheers of his supporters, he paid tribute to Neil Kinnock, the man who started the fight back, and to John Neil Smith, whose words he remembered. All we ask is the chance to serve. Tony Blair has been given that chance on a night that means the record book will have to be rewritten. A new dawn has broken, has it not? And it is wonderful. We always said that if we had the courage to change, then we could do it, and we did it. And let me say this to you. The British people have put their trust in us. It is a moving and it is a humbling experience. And the size of our likely majority now imposes a special sort of responsibility upon us. If John Major knew he was heading for defeat, he could never have allowed himself to believe it would be defeat on this scale. He'd watched as minister after minister, backbencher after backbencher, were swept away by Labour's tidal wave. The scenes at Conservative Central Office this morning could not have been more different from five years ago. John Major adopted a sporting metaphor. Sometimes he said, the ball just rolls away from you. We, tonight we have suffered a very bad defeat. Let us not pretend to ourselves it was anything other than what it was. Unless we accept it for what it was and look at it, we will be less able to put it right. We've lost some very good servants of the party, people who've <laughs> devoted a huge amount of their life to the service of this country and the service of this party. We've lost, temporarily I hope, some colleagues, both senior and not so senior, who still have a lot of service to give this country and this party and who will, I hope, be back where they should be in the House of Commons serving us all. Yeah.
The look on the faces of senior Tory figures marked the defeat of yet another cabinet minister. Labour took many famous scalps, but perhaps the one they celebrated most was that of Michael Portillo. He was planning to run for the party leadership. Now he had to face life out of Parliament altogether. A truly uh, terrible night for the Conservatives. Uh, I would have wished to have been part of rebuilding it inside the House of Commons. I can't now do that but I would like to do whatever I can from the wings to help rebuild a great party which has a great future. But a future without the Foreign Secretary, Malcolm Rifkind, the most senior member of the Cabinet to fall, both he and the Scottish Secretary, Michael Forsyth, were potential candidates for the leadership. Both fell by the wayside as the Conservatives lost every seat they held in Scotland. Wales, too, is now a Tory-free zone. The Conservatives hold no seats outside England. The massive swing to Labour was evident from the outset, but it was Birmingham Edgbaston, the first gain of the night, that confirmed that only the safest of Tory seats were remotely secure. Labour took seats all across the Midlands and the North, and for the first time in decades made serious inroads in the home counties. Stevenage fell with ease, although opening the champagne proved more of a problem, no problem for Labour, though, in parts of Sussex and Kent, as Tory majorities of over 10,000 tumbled. Famous faces were forced into reluctant smiles. David Meller, former cabinet minister turned media star, fell in Putney, jeered out by the leader of the referendum party. It's a derisory total. The referendum party is dead in the water. And Sir James, you can get off back to Mexico knowing your attempt to buy the British political system has failed. Thank you very much. But while the referendum party fared ill, the Liberal Democrats scored triumph after triumph in their target seats. Paddy Ashdown now leads the strongest third-party force since the 1930s. While he lost some of his old parliamentary team, he gained many more, especially in the southwest, now Liberal Democrat country. We are the largest force of Liberal Democrats and Liberals that this country has had since the days of Lloyd George. And, and we will use that force, we will use the vote that people have given us in the next Parliament with a hugely increased number of Liberal Democrat members of Parliament to fight every minute, every second, every hour through the next Parliament for those things that we have campaigned for in this election. And up in Tatton, the constituency that attracted attention more than any other, the anti-corruption candidate Martin Bell easily defeated the former minister Neil Hamilton. I believe you have lit a beacon which will shed light in some dark corners and illuminate the mother of Parliament itself. It is a strong signal to the rest of the country which will be heeded. But it was Tony Blair's night as he flew down from his Sedgefield constituency to join that party in London, he knew that he was only the third Labour leader to win a Commons majority, the youngest Prime Minister since 1812. He'll start forming his cabinet later today, negotiating in Europe within weeks. But for now, he was savouring a victory of such breathtaking magnitude that the political world is quite literally at his feet. Lance Price, BBC News. All right, let's go to Islington now, the home of Tony Blair. I suppose you should say the former home of Tony Blair. And there it is, with uh, the obvious retinue of photographers outside. Nothing much happening there. A couple of uh, Labour posters in the window. Tony Blair's home. He is about to become the youngest Prime Minister since 1812. He is about to move to a rather more famous address. Let us cross London to a more central position, Tory central office where the Conservative Party chairman, Dr. Brian Mulwiney, is still inside, and we are expecting at some stage to see him come out. Dr. Mulwiney, who has already been facing up to the size of the defeat and telling those who've talked to him overnight that uh, there is a need for a period of calm reflection. Now, it is time to uh, go to Scotland, where pretty extraordinary things have been happening, and uh, Sally Magnuson is the person who is there. Sally, good morning. Good morning, Justin. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm outside the building that Labour has promised will one day soon house a new Scottish Parliament subject to the approval of the Scottish people in a referendum that they say will be held within a very few months. Andy Castle reports now on the events uh, through the night in Scotland which uh, seem likely to bring this building to life again. 
Labour cheer in Scotland, celebrating not only their success, but a result which has left the Conservatives with not a single MP north of the border. All ten Tory seats were lost. In Edinburgh, the Foreign Secretary, Malcolm Rifkind, was among three Scottish Cabinet Ministers to go, ousted by Labour. In Galloway, the President of the Board of Trade, Ian Lang, was defeated by the SNP, while in Stirling, the Scottish Secretary, Michael Forsyth's wafer-thin majority, was finally overcome by Labour at the third attempt. I think we've just been in the wash of the tidal wave. It doesn't stop at the border. Um, clearly, what was sweeping the country, as I say, was this potent uh, force for change. Labour now has 57 of Scotland's 72 seats, though the election of Britain's first Muslim MP and govern, businessman Mohammed Sarwa, was marred by clashes at the Count Centre between British National Party supporters and anti-fascists. That could not, however, dampen the Scottish Party's spirits. The question was asked, who speaks for Scotland? There is now absolutely no doubt at all. It's the Scottish Labour Party that does it. I'm so proud of those who carried the flag into this campaign, and prouder still of the Scottish people who, when asked the question, answered with such a resounding voice. With one result still to come, the Liberal Democrats are on target to keep their nine seats, while the Nationalists are delighted with their performance. Their share of the vote held firm, and their target seats delivered. They'll be sending six MPs back to the Commons, two more than they had in the last Parliament. Now we've increased both our share of the vote tonight, and we've doubled our parliamentary representation. Now, even the most hostile observer would have to concede that's a pretty impressive step forward for the SNP. But the broader smiles belong to Labour, though they know they'll soon have to return to the hustings in a two-question referendum seeking a mandate for a Scottish Parliament with tax-bearing powers. At the Castle, BBC News, Glasgow. I'm joined now by the Scottish political editor, Brian Taylor. No Conservatives in Scotland. This is uncharted territory. Where on earth do we go from here? The jibe that has regularly been given at the Conservatives north of the border is that they are effectively an English party. Now they are indeed in practice. They have no councils that they control in Scotland. They now have no MPs as well. There are practical matters. For example, in the House of Commons, there is much Scottish legislation that goes through. Um, there will be a problem because there will be no Conservatives to, to offer effective or indeed any opposition. Um, from Scotland to and that legislation. They'll, and they'll who is the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland? There isn't one. They'll have to find someone. They'll have to draft someone in from the English ranks or perhaps from the Whip's office to be the formal um, opposition to the Labour Party on Scottish legislation, Scottish matters and at Scottish questions. But if I were the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, I would question the legitimacy of that, if you like, and uh, perhaps be hassling for a seat on the front bench. But seriously, the, the, the Conservatives will have a considerable problem um, putting themselves forward as a serious party of contention in Scotland at all. And these, no these two parties, you, you mentioned incidentally the, the SNP and the Liberal Democrats, already tussling over who's going to be the official opposition in Scotland. Yes, well, the SNP say that they gained the second place in terms of the share of the vote, but they only have those six seats. Actually, in terms of the SNP, I think it's, it's a relatively, I stress relatively, disappointing night for them. Alex Salmon, for example, had a bet. Uh, a charity bet that he would, his party would gain a minimum of seven seats. I think the upper level was something like 40. Now, he hasn't got that seven seats. He hasn't broken into any of the Labour areas. OK, it's an increase, a slight increase in his, in, in his party's share of the vote, and it's doubling the number of MPs. But double three is not very it. much. But it's double three to six. It's the great irony for the Scottish Conservatives, of course, is that if they're going to make any impact at all on the Scottish political scene, they're actually going to have to stand for the Parliament that they have so despised and derided. I, I, I have long believed that the Conservatives in Scotland have faced a decline over 40 years from a 1955 high point to what we see now with no MPs. I have long believed that if there is a salvation for the Scottish Conservatives, and after tonight it must be certainly in question, if there is one, it rests here. It rests in devolution. If they can puncture the Scottish question over a longer period, then perhaps under a PR system, uh, ironically, which of course they oppose, and under uh, elections to devolve Parliament, they might get back something of a stake in the seats behind us here. But as of tonight, the story in Scotland is, of course, the Labour Party, 56 MPs, and a dominant position, even more dominant than, than, than previously. Um, one or two within Labour ranks, I'm sure, will say, now they're in such a dominant UK and GB position, do they need to go through the, the, the business of devolution at all? And that sort of notion, I think, will be crushed very severely. But they from couldn't, the they of the couldn't party. say that. They couldn't, could they? indeed, because they're looking at a longer term. They're looking at least at two terms of, of, of government, and, and that would, would, would be placed in jeopardy, certainly in Scotland, whether to be any backtracking. I'm confident that, that from a Labour perspective, there will not be. And going back to the Scottish Conservatives, I mean, where, where would you think any, any sort of rebirth and new growth 
would come from. I mean, there have been a few closet pro-devolutionists who've, who've kept rather quiet over the last few years. Would you think the future lies there? I think it would be literally incredible for the party to go down that road speedily. They might go down that in the, in, in the longer route. The main problem they, they will face, for example, is they have lost the, the paid apparatchiks. They've lost the MPs, the researchers, the backup. They really have, at the moment, a big hole to dig themselves out of, if you like to mix right. the metaphors. Right, Tim. Well, thank you very much. Back to you, Justin. So thanks a lot. It is uh, 25 minutes to 7. Let's give you an update now for people who've just switched on and indeed for people who want to uh, take in the significance of what has been happening overnight. Tony Blair will be the next Prime Minister as Labour celebrates its biggest victory ever. It was a landslide of historic proportions with the latest result showing Labour winning 417 seats. The Conservatives, it was electoral meltdown. John Major, who will be tendering his resignation to the Queen later this morning, said his party had been comprehensively defeated. A number of cabinet ministers lost their seats, and Martin Bell defeated Neil Hamilton in the battle for Hatton. And I think we can show you the state of the parties just now. Just to repeat, landslide for Labour. We are predicting at the moment. We are predicting at the moment a Labour majority of 179. A Labour majority of 179. There are, of course, plenty of seats still to report. Now, I mentioned there uh, Martin Bell. He was once, of course, a war correspondent for the BBC. Now, Mr Bell will sit in the House of Commons as an independent MP. He is the first to do so in nearly 50 years. He won in Tatton, in Cheshire, with a majority of 11,000. He defeated the Tory candidate, Neil Hamilton who, as an MP, was at the centre of the Cash for Questions row. In Nutsford, in the early hours, the news of Martin Bell's victory made sweet viewing for his supporters at their celebration party. Earlier, Neil Hamilton and his wife Christine had arrived for the Tatton Count, saying, we'll survive. He didn't. Martin Bell... Independent. 29,300... Martin Bell stood as an independent on a platform of honesty and integrity. His stunning success in this Tory heartland can be judged on the pure arithmetic. His 11,000 majority wiped out a notional Conservative majority twice that size. I believe you have lit a beacon which will shed light in some dark corners and illuminate the Mother of Parliaments itself. It is a strong signal to the rest of the country which will be heeded. The former minister at the centre of the Cash for Questions affair insisted that he would return. I know that I shall be vindicated when Sir Gordon Downey's report is published very shortly. And then the full confidence of my supporters in me will be fully repaid and justified. Martin Bell says he has no long-term political ambitions and that he'll only be serving one parliamentary term. He says his priority will be his constituents and he'll do what he can for them by working to raise standards in the House of Commons. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News, with Martin Bell's winning campaign in Nutsford. There we are. I hope we're going to talk to Martin Bell later on in the programme. Let's cross again now to uh, Conservative Central Office. There is the scene as the Prime Minister leaves. He uh, made a speech to party workers in there, which was an um, extraordinary performance, really, a dignified performance, in which he managed considerable humour. Uh, but he also said, we are a great historic party, the Conservative Party. We have had great victories in our time. We've had great defeats. Tonight, we've been comprehensively defeated, he said. We have listened to the voice of the electorate. We will consider what has been told to us. And he said, we must reflect upon it. He did not, of course, he did not uh, mention the word resignation. And indeed, most of those, indeed all of those, who might be considered to be possible candidates for the leadership, should he decide to go, uh, have also not been pressing their cases this morning. Uh, the expectation among some is that he might hold on for some time in order to allow the party to uh, regroup. And certainly from the tone of his speech this morning, uh, it did rather seem as if he might be tempted to do exactly that. And, of course, it's worth reminding ourselves that several of the people who might have been contenders, um, like Michael Portillo, the Defence Secretary, former Defence Secretary, have themselves lost their seats. So the whole uh, thing is rather up for grabs, even if John Major were to go. Now, uh, Robin Oakley and uh, Tony King here. Robin Oakley, you were...
talking earlier on about the possible runners and riders. I cut you off before you had time to get to uh, Michael Howard. Yes, Michael Howard there? was the one that we, we hadn't covered. Obviously, strong right-wing Eurosceptic who's made quite a pitch on law and order. But it can't do an awful lot of good for his chances that the Tories seem to feel they had to keep him out of the front line through the election campaign. They must have felt that he was not exactly that much of a vote winner for the party. We didn't see a lot of his law and order pitch during the election. Tony King, what does the um, wipeout in Wales and Scotland for the Conservatives, what does that wipeout do for them as a, as, as a party in terms of their ability to organise themselves as, as, a, as a national party? Well, they've not only been wiped out in Scotland and wiped out in Wales, they've been wiped out in practically the whole of urban Britain. The Conservative members of Parliament at the moment represent almost entirely posh suburbs on the one hand and rural areas uh, full of sheep and, uh, and older people, retired people on the other. And uh, it is going to be very hard to start to rebuild. The best hope for the Conservatives is that at some time in the midterm, maybe in a year or two, they will begin to recover ground in local government. And when you begin to have a network of local councillors, you can begin to rebuild a local organisation. But I think it is going to be very difficult indeed for them. They have suffered the lowest share of the vote the Conservatives have had since just after the Great Reform Act of 1832. It hasn't been in quite a meltdown. They're still going to have about 160 seats. It's not on Canadian uh, proportions where the Tories in Canada were left with only two. But it is a horrendous defeat. It is interesting, incidentally, I don't know whether you've noticed, we've got so used to the Conservatives squabbling. The first thing we ask ourselves about when they lose an election is how are they going to sort themselves out, who is going to be their next leader, and so on. But in fact, the story now is not a story about the Conservative Party, it's a story about a new Prime Minister and a new government. What's it going to do? And Robin Oakley, what Tony King was telling us earlier on, not just a matter of personalities too, a matter of finding policies around which the party can, can unite. And well, uh, we're looking at pictures now, I, I should tell you, of uh, the Prime Minister arriving in Downing Street, which is not of course, his home for much longer. Um, so as we watch him come out, um, Robin, what on earth is his party going to do? Not in terms of personality, not in terms of leadership candidates, in terms of something they all believe in. Well, it's very difficult for them to find exactly what is to be their new pitch now. Uh, the banner of Euroscepticism is hardly uh, one around which they can unite and hope to succeed when two parties being more Euro-friendly than they are have scored such a success in this election. And those who'd been taking a hardline Eurosceptic position haven't been insulated in any way from the Conservative defeat. Uh, Theresa Gorman, for example, an 18% swing against her. So there's, there's no great future for the Tories, it seems, in Euroscepticism in terms of finding a way back to the heart of the British public. They've got real problems, as we were hearing from Scotland, uh, on the devolution question with no MPs left in Scotland or Wales. And as Tony King's been saying, that there is still a basic disagreement at the heart of the Tory party about whether they want to be a Thatcherite party still or whether they want to tack back to the centre ground of politics, which they've made the hideous mistake of allowing Labour to okay. occupy. Robin, thank you. We will uh, seek reaction from elsewhere now. Before we do, though, I should... Uh, so there are recounts going on that are pretty interesting ones. There have been two recounts, second recount going on uh, in Kettering, uh, Roger Freeman's seat, and in Winchester there is also a recount going on. Of course, as soon as those results um, come in, we will bring them to you. Let's uh, see if we can go to Brussels now, where our correspondent uh, James Robin can give us a bit of uh, reaction. And also, um, Paul Burden is down there in the city. Um, James, first of all, um, relief, d dancing in the Euro streets? Uh, they're not yet on the streets, but there's no doubt that they are delighted with the result. Other European governments had said publicly that they wanted a strong government to deal with in London, one with a big mandate, uh, one that was not driven from the back benches and they saw as being much less Eurosceptic. Privately, they were saying they wanted a change, so they've uh, got what they wanted uh, in spades, if you like. Uh, but they're, not, they're portraying this not as simply as a change, not simply as Blair rolling over in front of Helmut Kohl, uh, he's made it clear that it will still be a tough negotiation from his perspective. Uh, and uh, Mr. Cole has said uh, that he's looking forward to meeting Tony Blair within the next couple of weeks to start the process of negotiation. Is there a sense, uh, do you think, and will, will Labour be cautious uh, and, and wary because is there an ambush being, um, being prepared for them in the sense that um, in the first flush of victory uh, might those who want to press ahead with the European federal dream might they think that they might be able to push Labour perhaps a bit further than they might have gone in, a, in more sober times? I think in a sense perhaps the reverse. 
uh, there will be a real willingness to do deal from Britain well, uh, and a desire to show that, uh, just as he says, Right, I think we've lost the sound there on uh, James now Robinson. So let's go to the city and Paul Burden, who we can see, and I hope we can hear there. Um, Paul, the, the city expected this. They like stability, don't they? And that looks like uh, exactly what they're going to get. Well, uh, yes, uh, what has happened today had been largely written into the markets by last night. Yesterday, the FTSE finished on a record high. That's the reverse, traditionally, of what you expect when a Labour victory is about to happen. Uh, you normally expect the markets to, to be rather anxious. There is some anxiety around this morning about the size of the Labour victory. The sense is that, in fact, this might give the Labour Party free reign to do whatever they liked, and there's some anxiety about that. I don't know if you can still hear me. Ah, yes, you can. <laughs> Um, it should be said that the pound, and traditionally one of the first jobs of a Labour government coming into power after a long period of Conservative government, has been to rush to defend sterling. Well, that doesn't seem to, seem to be a problem today. I think we may be able to show you what the pound is actually doing this morning. Uh, there it is against the Deutsche Mark, very slightly ahead. In other words, uh, what has happened is what was expected. It went up a little bit last night um, after the first exit poll suggested a very large uh, Labour government. It's been very steady against other currencies as well. In fact, this morning, the biggest influence in the market here may not be the election result here but what is happening across the water in America on Wall Street. Right, Paul, thank you very much for the time being. Sorry we showed uh, pictures of Mr Blair apparently going backwards in his car halfway through. We'll try to show you those pictures uh, forwards in just a uh, few moments' time. Now, as last night wore on, people soon realised that they were in the midst of an historic election. Our reporter Emma Howard spent last night with two very different election night parties. By midnight, London streets were filling with elated Labour supporters. This is a victory rose. There's two left tonight, and this is the winning rose. This was turning into a night for new Labour and new voters. In the student bar at London University, they were high on hope. Very, very happy, very glad. It's about time we had a change. I'm really surprised because I didn't think it would be such a big, you know, change, but I'm really, really happy because I'm Labour. Well, I've never lived under the Labour government, so I'm confident in the change that it will make. I'm looking forward to see what's going to happen. Even hours after the polls had closed, Tony Blair was still winning converts here. I voted for the first time. I voted Conservative and actually looking this evening looking at the Labour Party, looking at Tony Blair and all the other members of the Labour Party. They're very confident. Seeing how they work now, I probably realise they actually cast the wrong vote. After 18 years of the Tories making political history, tonight they face a new era, and their supporters gathering inside to hear the bad news fear the worst. As Tony Blair got closer to Downing Street, the son of former Tory Prime Minister Harold Macmillan warned that we'd never had it so good and Labour would blow it. Tony Blair would give this country's heritage, tradition and its sovereignty away to the bureaucrats in Europe. The only party that won't do that is, is the Conservative Party. But the Conservatives' grip on power was slipping away. At the Savoy Hotel, city stockbrokers looked on in disbelief as Labour's victory turned into a landslide. It was all too much for some. Angry, hurt, disillusioned, and I want to go home. It'll be interesting to see in the coming months um, how bad it gets. And I think people will regret the decision that they've made today. But unfortunately, by the time they have a chance to put it all right, in whatever period it might be, it's going to be too late. But as the results came flooding in, it was clear Labour had caught the optimistic mood. Though for some, waking up to a new government this morning will seem like a bad dream. Emma Howard, BBC News. Here we are. It's the scene at the party parties. Let's have a look at the papers now, the uh, first editions, or what seem to be the first editions here in front of me. Yes, I think, uh, I think the Times is it anyway. Landslide vi victory for Labour. And uh, Matthew Paris writing rather interestingly there, can I stay a Tory? I'm not sure what his answer to that is, um, but uh, I'm sure it'll make fascinating reading. The FT, Labour in landslide victory, Blair's party heads for biggest lead ever as Tory gamble fails, says the FT. There were tabloids, the sun, yes, it's me. Lead as Blair storms to number 10, the mirror, pretty similar actually. Yes, Prime Minister. And just time to show you the telegraph as well, Blair wins by landslide. The uh, headline writers, not desperately imaginative, but you do uh, get the uh, picture. Now, 
There is one thing that stays with us, whether we have elections or whatever we have, and that, of course, is the weather. It's time to go to uh, John Catley, who is at uh, the BBC Weather Centre. John. Good morning to you, Justin. Well, politics aside, of course, as you say, there's no change in the weather, really, across the bulk of the country. It's going to be another very warm and sunny day. We're looking at temperatures today of around 23 degrees, typically about 25 degrees in some central and southern parts of England. Noticeably colder way up in the far north of Scotland, though. Temperature in Shetland just five at the moment with some drizzle. It will turn colder from the north in the next 24 hours. Now, one or two mist and fog patches in the south. Well, mist, really. That's rapidly clearing away this morning to leave unbroken sunshine. And the sunshine returning to Shetland fairly soon this morning as well. But there will be patchy light rain moving into other northern parts of Scotland as we go through the afternoon. Certainly a colder feel to the weather up there later on today. And then patches of rain moving further south across northern Britain tonight. Otherwise, it'll be fine and clear and not too cold once again. Typical temperatures tonight around about 6 to 8 degrees, possibly at the lowest. One or two mist and fog patches developing again in the south, but really not very consequential at all. But we'll see a big breakdown in the weather as we go through the weekend. It looks like we're going to see some showery bursts of rain moving in from the southwest during Saturday. Very warm and sunny in other parts on Saturday, but then turning much more unsettled with some wet weather about on Sunday. Well, that's it from me. Back to Justin. John, thank you very much. It is uh, nine minutes to seven o'clock. Tony Blair is to be this country's next Prime Minister. He will be the youngest Prime Minister since 1812. We will bring you much more information about their extraordinary win and analysis of it in just a few seconds. First, though, the election news in your area. Hello, good morning from the southeast, where the Labour Party have blown apart traditional Tory strongholds across the region. Going into this election, the southeast was awash with blue. Now, Labour has repainted the map, gaining 21 seats outside the capital and 24 within. The Liberal Democrats are also celebrating this morning. They successfully targeted their campaign, winning six seats in southwest London and Oxford West and Abingdon. Some of the biggest guns in the Tory party were forced into retreat. Defeats for Defence Secretary Michael Portillo, Dame Angela Rumbold, the party vice chairman, London Transport Minister John Bowis and the former Cabinet Minister uh, Jonathan Aitken. All of them fell to Labour. Anthony Andrew Amos has... In 1992, it was the smile which sank a thousand Labour hopes. Basildon was the first seat to declare, and Labour's failure to take it extinguished their hopes of election victory. By the early hours of this morning, David Amos long departed for safer climbs. His majority had vanished with him. Angela Smith, the local councillor, took the seat for Labour on a swing of nearly 15%. Tonight's spectacular result makes it clear that 18 years of Tory government has now ended. The first high-profile casualty of the night, the Transport Minister for London, John Bowis, on his bike after losing Battersea on a 10% swing. That 1,500 votes is a derived... Sir James Goldsmith revelling in the defeat of David Mellor in Putney. Votes for the referendum party helped hand the seat to Labour. Mr Mellor repaid him in kind. You know, I'm afraid that Putney said, up your hacienda, Jimmy. Well, David Mellor there, and Kent has always been a bastion of conservatism, at least for the last 20 years. But even in this bluest of counties, Labour have made inroads overnight, winning eight seats. With record swings, they gained Dover, South Thanet, Sittingbourne and Sheppey, Gillingham, Chatham and Aylesford, Medway, Gravesham and Dartford. David Shaw was one of the main casualties in Kent. His Dover seat fell on a swing of 11%, more than double the number Labour needed. Their candidate, Gwyn Prosser, said the results reflected the new appeal of Labour, particularly in counties in the southeast like Kent. It is, it is like a dream, and uh, not only in Dover and Deal, but right across Kent, we are winning seats, and of course right across the country, huge swings. It is, it, we really do feel we might wake up any moment. Well, that's Labour's dream realised, but the Liberal Democrats too have good reason to celebrate this morning, getting six MPs in the South East, their best performance in the region since before the war. After several years of local government success, they consolidated their grip on South West London, winning Twickenham, ousting a Tory MP Toby Jessel after more than a quarter of a century. They also won Kingston, Richmond, Sutton and Carshalton. 
And their long-cherished ambition of taking West Oxford was finally achieved. Dr Evan Harris is the new MP there, and he's in our Thames Valley studio now. Dr Harris, good morning to you. Is good this morning. a victory for tactical voting? Well, it was, no, it was a victory for the Liberal Democrats. Clearly there was some tactical voting, but we achieved a huge swing from the Conservatives and also a swing from Labour at a time when they were soaring in the national polls. And I think that says something about the judgment made by people in Oxford, West and Abingdon and other seats we won in the region about our platform. But you couldn't have done that if you hadn't eaten into the Labour vote and convinced Labour voters that you had a better chance than, than their candidate did of winning the seat from the Tories. Well, we did that, but the Labour vote rose and we'd expect it would rise, so there certainly wasn't any more tactical voting. What some people said was, yes, we're going to vote Liberal Democrat because we want to change but also because the Liberal Democrats actually offered a platform which represented change, more funding for public services, and fairness and honesty about the way to raise those resources, and that's what now we'll be putting in the next Parliament. It is interesting that you should have two MPs now in the Thames Valley because you managed to hold your by-election gain of Newbury. Indeed. What do you think the overall message is from the region to the Conservatives? Well, the Conservatives have been rejected, and it's, it's long overdue because they have uh, caused a great deal of social division uh, in our society, even in areas like the Thames Valley, and we are seeing in the Thames Valley and throughout the region cuts in education in our, and, and cuts in the NHS, and those have got to end. Dr. Now Harris, I... we'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much thank for you. joining us this morning. Dr. Evan Harris, the new Liberal Democrat MP in Oxford West. So where does all this leave the Tories? Well, our political editor, Don Brind, has been picking out the pieces of their now fragmented presence in the South East. Michael Heseltine played a central role in the election campaign and will play a key part in the rebuilding of the Tory party if he wants to. The last days of the campaign saw speculation that the Henley MP might be planning a new career in business. There's no doubt that John Redwood does intend to be a big player after surviving in his Wokingham constituency. When he challenged on Major for the Tory leadership, his slogan was, no change, no chance, and his supporters will see the Tory route as vindication of that view. The outgoing Home Secretary, Michael Howard, had a narrow squeak in Folkestone and Hythe, but he survived and will be a right-wing rival to John Redwood. The re-election of Theresa Gorman in Billericay will mean that the ideological arguments over Europe are unlikely to be stilled. And I really do believe that the new Conservative Party grouping in the House of Commons will reinforce and restate those values, which I think are dear to the heart, not just of my constituency, but to the whole of the British nation. The ranks of Tory women were swollen by two new MPs of a more loyalist cast of mind, Eleanor Lang in Epping Forest and Theresa May in Maidenhead. And the pro-European case will be championed by the father of the House of Commons, Sir Edward Heath. In this, his 13th general election, he was re-elected in Bexley and Old Sidcup. Looks like 13 is lucky for some at least, but one of the most flamboyant Conservative characters, Jerry Hayes, has been heavily defeated in Harlow in Essex. Labour's Bill Rannell now has a majority of more than 10,000. But Mr Hayes, who wants to continue his media work, wasn't letting it get him down. In facing defeat after 14 years as a Conservative MP, Jerry Hayes was remarkably upbeat. During the campaign, he's been punched, attacked by a dog, and even been the target of a flower missile. But he didn't feel his recent bad fortunes, including allegations about his private life, had any bearing on the result. No, I don't think that's made a heck of a difference at all. People are far, far more sensible than that. So what are you going to be doing next? Well, I don't know. Not your job. It's not enough money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open to offers, though. Not one to avoid the limelight, it's probably not the last we'll see of Jerry Hayes. Sarah Harris, Newsroom South East, Harlow. And now I'm going to have a sleep. <laughs> well, those who won't be sleeping yet, yet are the county councillors who are waiting for their results to come in. Local election battles being fought over control of councils across the home counties. Last time round, the Tories lost control of Kent, Essex and Surrey. Only Buckinghamshire was left under Conservative control. So far, the Tories in Kent have made a net gain of three seats. That's thanks to a high turnout, and they need another six to regain control of County Hall after four years. We'll have those results in our later bulletins. We leave you now, though, with pictures of the celebrations for the Labour Party's supporters at the Royal Festival Hall in central London. Those look likely to continue for some time to come. That's it from Newsroom South East for now. More from us in an hour's time.